I would like to uh, first off thank Dean from the bottom of my heart for sharing his knowledge. Um, Dean started growing plants uh, when he worked in a garden center while still in high school. Uh, when he lived in Chicago over 40 years ago, uh, he studied botany uh, college and graduated school, in graduate school, sorry, and uh, has uh, cycled through various plants interests since moving to California in 1986. So um, he didn't start focusing in uh, carnivorous uh, plants until he picked up a couple of Saracenias and Pinks uh, and that he found on Craigslist in 1917, uh, sorry, 2017, that was <laughs> 2017. So uh, he picked up his first Drosophyllum in 2018. And um, let me tell you, uh, I have purchased Drosophyllums before. Most people grow them in little pots. And what happens when you have to repot that guy? You know, you're in trouble. Dean walked in with this huge drosophyllum in a huge pot, perfect and ready to go. And I bought one for him and I'm so grateful that I did because it's a beautiful plant. So with that, I always uh, gone back to Dean for, uh, uh, for advice and uh, has everything that he has told me has worked for me. So uh, we all wanna share his knowledge with you guys. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Dean, the floor is yours, my friend. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Braulio, thanks for asking me to, to, to give this little talk. Um, as he said, I've only been doing carnivores since 2017, so about four years now. I, um, I, I had Nepenthes years ago, but I got rid of them, and then I started up again, and if, I don't know if I'm like anybody else, but once I start with a group of plants, I kind of want to have them all. And so in very short order, I picked up way more plants than I should have, and they're all over the place. But one of them that I found uh, particularly um, fascinating was the Drosophilum. And I call it Drosophilum just because it's easier in my mouth for some reason. Um, I saw it online, uh, the, just the word, and I didn't even know what it was in a picture. I'm like, oh, that looks like a sundew. What's that? Um, so I did my research, I pulled out my uh, Savage Garden book, I looked online, and sure enough, that's, it's a carnivorous plant from Europe, and I thought, well, I gotta get me some of those. So um, I think in 2018, I saw some seeds uh, offered by Cascade Carnivores, and I bought a bunch of them, and then I looked down how to grow them. So this talk will be mostly about what I do to grow them, and then, um, Hopefully some of you will be able to share what you do if it's different um, and we can go from there. So this is just some of the ones I've grown over the years um, in different stages of growth. You can see uh, they come from Spain, Portugal, and Morocco uh, from a climate very, very, very similar to what we have here. So a dry Mediterranean climate, um, and they're one of the few carnivores you'll find that grows in a dry climate like, like you find in Spain and Portugal and Morocco. And when we think of carnivorous plants, we normally think of something that grows in a swamp or a bog, or at the very least on rocks with, this, with seeping water coming down over, uh, you know, over their roots. These don't have that um, opportunity. They grow in a dry place. So it's certainly a very different kind of carnivorous plant. So this photo I grabbed from the internet and it shows them in their natural habitat. Uh, you can see it's clearly a very, very dry area. I think someone called it in one of the articles I read a heath. Um, very dry, uh, arid looking place. Um, if you planted a Saracenia here and left it, uh, it would not last very long or and neither would a Nepenthes. So sim quite different from what we're used to. So there are some really cool things I like about Drosophilum, and one of the first ones is they smell good. If you have a big Drosophilum in your yard, you will smell it, and it smells like honey. Um, and I believe this is what, um, yeah, and it can perfume your whole growing area. I think this is what attracts all the bugs to it, because they catch a ton of insects. When you have an adult Drosophilum out there in your yard, 
it'll be covered with flies, moths, little butterflies, ants, you know, flying ants, whatever, you, whatever flies to it, it sticks to it. They are covered with goo. Uh, if you rub up against it, you will have a nice uh, coating of slime on your hand or whatever part of you rubbed against it. Um, they have beautiful little um, glands that produce this. Um, moving ahead, they have really big, beautiful yellow flowers. So in addition to being kind of this cool carniv carnivore with all these little red dots on it, that catches all the bugs in your yard and smells good, they have really pretty flowers. And, and the flowers seem to produce a ton of seeds. I've only had them flower for me one time and I have well over 100 seeds, so in the fridge. The one cool thing is they have exhibit a, a trait called outward circinate venation or vernation, I spelled that wrong, I'm, I'm sorry you guys. Um, and what it is, is if you think of how a fern grows, they grow from the inside out. Well, these guys, while they're still positioned, the leaves inside, they grow from the, I can't even do it, they grow from the outside in. And I've got a shot here that shows this on the plant. So you see here on the left, um, they unfurl from the outside into the inside, which is quite unique in the plant world, I think. Um, some people might know more plants that do this, but, um, when I first noticed that, before I even looked it up online, I was like, what the heck's going on here? So it, uh, it's, a, it's just a, a really, really cool plant. And the last thing about that, I, the cool thing about Drosophila that I like is that they're really easy to grow. Obviously there are conditions you need to provide them with like you do with any other plant. But, um, you know, I threw some seeds in some pots the way I wanted to do it and they grew. So for me, that's easy. Uh, seeds are always a challenge, I find, <clears throat> for many reasons, but these guys grow fairly well. Okay, let's see what we got here. But there are challenges. They require an unusual soil mix. You cannot just put them in peat and perlite like you would a Saracenia, uh, or long fibrous sphagnum moss for that matter. Uh, because they come from an arid climate uh, in habitat, you would, you would want to try to mirror that. It's a very, um, the mix I use, which I will illustrate shortly, uh, is very loose and while it holds water, it doesn't stay soggy. Um, where are we? Next slide. They seem to only be able to be propagated by seed. Uh, everything I've read says you can't you do leaf cuttings, you can't do stem cuttings or anything like that. So and so you grow them by seed, and they're pretty easy to do. So. Uh, I have grown them in 10 or 12 inch clay pots. Uh, I do like clay pots and I'll show you what I do with them in just a moment. The other thing Braulio mentioned, they don't like to have their roots disturbed. Uh, this seems to be a universal thing with them. Uh, every writer who writes about them says, you know, you can't transplant them, they die. So I've never tried. And the method I use to grow them uh, allows me to not have to worry about transplanting them. And the one last thing about Drosophila that's quite challenging, and many of you who have grown them may have experienced this, is that sudden death happens to them quite frequently. Um, some of the things I've read online says they're really just a two-year plant, like a biennial. Um, they will be looking just fine and then the next day you're like, oh, what's going on there? Some of those leaves look a little limp and dry looking. And the next thing you know, within 10 days, you have a dead plant. So uh, it seems universal. Everybody who grows these seems to have this issue. I don't know how to make it any better, but one way to do that is to just keep planting seeds. So here's what I do to grow them. And this is a really simple illustration, step by step. When Braulio asked me to do this talk, I thought, well, maybe I should take some photos of how I grow these things so people could see. And also I wanted to create some seedlings to offer for the raffle. So, um, so here we go. You start with a clay pot and I found, uh, I've grown them in 10 inch and 12 inch clay pots. 10 inch clay pots do fine, 12 inch clay pots do better. The plants grow larger. I would like to try eventually doing a 14 inch clay pot, but they're so big and they take up so much space that I, uh, I just don't have room for it right now. So uh, that I may try over the summer to grow some in a, in a bigger pot to see if we get even bushier and bigger plants. 
when I grow things in clay pots, because of that big hole in the bottom, I always put a little piece of uh, broken pot in there to keep the soil in. And because the mix we're using for these is loose and grainy, um, it really does help to keep the soil in the pot. And these are the components of the soil mix I use. And I use peat moss, perlite, pumice, and sand in equal quantities by volume. You can see these little cottage cheese containers. Uh, so if you're gonna make your, your mix, you would do X number of peat moss, moss scoops, X number of perlite, always the same, and mix it into your, into your mix. When you get it all in there, you, uh, you, you, you do a good mix on it all. Um, I love these big tubs from, from H Mart, by the way, if any of you need them, that's the place to get them. Perfect for all of our, our uses. Okay, then you start filling the pot up and you keep filling it until you're almost at the top. But then you wanna produce, you wanna pull out your peat pots and I have used the little three inch peat pots for this and there is a reason for it. Because you cannot transplant these, these, these seedlings, I make it so that, the, that they end up in their lifelong pot right from the beginning. The little peat pot like this, you fill with the same soil you bury it into the, uh, the bigger pot, and you can then water your seedlings quite easily inside this little peat pot. I drill the holes in it with a, with a knife to allow this, the eventual roots to uh, extend through these holes into the rest of the pot. And so once you get started, starting up here on the left, upper left, you just set the pot in there, you fill it, the peat pot, I should say, you fill it, you keep filling until you're right up to the top of the pot and it, the surfaces are you know, roughly even between the peat pot and the surrounding pot. Um, this mix is so grainy and doesn't really, you can't squeeze it into a ball. So what I find is that I like to top dress these pots so that all that perlite doesn't float to the surface and blow away. Uh, if you've grown stuff in perlite before, you know it, uh, every time you water, it kind of floats to the top and then needs, to, it, it, for me, it ends up in the pool, which I really don't like. So, so I found this gravel that I, that I think is really cool. It's called Salmon River Gravel. You can find it at those landscape uh, supply places where they sell the compost and the large rocks and things. And um, it really makes a nice, a nice uh, top dressing for succulents, for these kind of carnivorous plants and anything that you don't want your soil to flop out. Uh, so here we go, ready to, um, almost ready to plant. What I found, uh, and this happens, this, this helps with a, a lazy gardener. If you put a layer of just pure peat moss across the top of your little peat pot, you can keep that wet and it allows the seeds to germinate much more easily and it also keeps what's with the soil from flopping out. So I fill that with a little bit of peat, maybe a half an inch, quarter of an inch. And then we get to our seeds. The seeds of Drosophilum are either black or kind of a dark gray. They are teardrop shaped and they're rigid. The outsides of them are rigid. Um, they store really well in the refrigerator. They're in my the little butter a little butter compartment uh, and they just keep uh, they keep forever there are reports online of them of people pulling 20 year old seeds out and having them germinate so uh, once you get them you can keep them and keep planting the plants over the years as you go. Drosophilum seeds need to be uh, scarified they need if you want them to grow quickly so uh, and some people would rub these on sandpaper. I found if you just clip the tip off of the little, the little pointy end there, uh, they do okay. And I don't know how I figured that out, but I did and it generally works. So you can see I've got them, you hold them in, in a tweezer, you take your tiny little scissors and you just snip. And once those have been snipped, they look like this. I believe that that seed on the, on the right may have been cut too far. And that is a problem. If you, uh, if you cut them too deep, you can damage the embryo inside the seed. So, so you gotta be careful. 
Um, and then you go in and you just place the seeds in that damp peat moss in the center of your big pot. Uh, they tend to float, so I will nudge them down into, into the peat so that they can stay moist and not wash away or blow away. And again, oh, I should say I grow these outside, so um, they're open to the elements. And I have taken recently to planting three in a pot to make sure that there's always at least one that grows. I've gotten as many as three to germinate. I've never gotten three of them to continue growing. Usually it's only just two or one, and I don't know. There's some talk online in some of the articles that the, that the seeds create some kind of growth inhibitor that does not allow nearby seeds to, uh, to germinate well. So that may be part of what's going on, but I just don't know. So the pots that I have in the raffle, uh, I planted on January 2nd. On February 6th, I believe it was, we looked again closely and sure enough, three little sprouts were coming out of one of the pots. Um, I've also planted these in warmer times of the year, so August and September, and they seem to grow just a little bit faster. I think the cold weather and the shorter days in January might have inhibited the speed of germination just a little bit. And here's the little, the little guy. You can actually see the seed coat here that's left and the two first little leaves that come up and they show that outward circinate vernation quite well, just right out of the center and externally unfurling. So uh, right from the start, and this is how you know you've been successful because you see this little green thing with two little curved points out of the tip. And um, so you're on your way here. And, and once this happens, it's pretty much going to be successful for you. Uh, this was taken just last week of these seedlings. Um, you know, they're probably about two and a half to three inches tall. Uh, since then, I have moved them from where I, from where I was growing them, which was in maybe half day sun to a place where it's full sun and uh, they've already expanded in their growth already. So they're, they're really, they really are sun loving plants. In this photo, uh, I have two kind of two generations of plants. I have the one in the rear is a larger plant that I started in 2018. And the plant in the foreground, or, or actually two plants in the foreground are um, are from the summer of 2020. So a difference in size, um, quite considerable. You see in the rear plant, the larger older plant, you do get a lot of old uh, leaves building up in there. Now I've seen pictures online of people going and trim all that back and, and make it almost into like this little, little bonsai plant. I am a chicken when it comes to these guys. I don't like to touch them or manipulate them too much because I'm afraid I'm gonna I'm gonna cause a sudden death <laughs> and and kill it. So I I generally will just leave all those, that that big skirt of dead leaves on there. I also wonder if that doesn't help to uh, keep the stem and the roots uh, cooler in the heat of summer. And so while I was working on this presentation and coming up with things to show you guys and talk about, I took a close look and I found some flower buds in that big plant. And this was just a week ago. And then this week it opened. And this, you know, amongst carnivores, this, if you're, this is really a, a unique and beautiful flower. The ridged petals in the bright yellow color and they're well over an inch across. So. They're just, um, when you get this, it's just such an exciting thing. Um, I don't really know how they're pollinated, I'll be honest with you, uh, but I last year all the flowers that came up ended up pollinated. They all produced seed. I did have a second plant that flowered and it was, it had finished and you could see the, the seed capsules were growing, but sudden death caught it and it died before they were ready. So 
um, as these, after they're pollinated, and I don't have photos of this because I wasn't thinking I was going to give a talk last summer, um, you'll see a green shiny seed capsule emerge from the sepals, which, um, which remain green for a long time. Uh, that capsule gets longer and longer and sticks out maybe about half an inch out of those sepals. And as it gets ripe and ready to, dis to drop the seed, it will turn sort of a grayish brown and get very papery looking. And then one day you'll see it's sort of cracked open a little bit, split open. Uh, and at that point I harvested the seeds and, um, and stored them. I did a test last summer uh, with that pot that I showed previously with the two small plants. I did a test in that pot to check out um, to check out germination, both from the plants, I, the, the seeds I'd had in my fridge for a long time, and the new, new seeds. And some of the new seeds were different color. Like I said, they were black and they were gray. So I planted two of each around the pot of the old seeds, the black seeds, and the new seeds. And all of them grew. Not all of them survived, but I ended up with, um, with two different plants in that pot. But they all germinated. And uh, so I was kind of happy about that to see that the, you know, that the older seeds were still as good as the new ones. And both color seeds didn't have any issues. So once you get to this, you know, once your, your seedlings have germinated, you have three or four leaves, maybe, maybe uh, they're four or five inches tall. They really are adult, can be treated like adult plants. They need full sun. Uh, I don't think there's any way of getting around this. If you can give them an all day sun exposure, they're, they're gonna be really happy with you. Uh, even half day, they still do pretty well, I've seen. This is the weird part, because you think about them, they're, they come from a dry habitat, but they really need a lot more water than you think they would. You think you would grow them like a succulent, right? But you can't, they'll die. You grow them, I don't know, I water from the top, I water probably every two or three days, I don't flood the pots. I water, and it's almost impossible to flood the pots. That soil mix is so granular and so loose that, um, that the water does kind of flow right through. But if you keep them on the, the, the moistened side, uh, I think you're gonna see really good growth out of them. If you try to grow them dry, I don't think you'll have um, any success at all. How they get this water in habitat, I, I don't really know. They talk about, oh, the mist comes in or things like that. But it's a habitat like ours where it rains just part of the year and the rest of the year it's really dry. So hard to know what to, uh, to think about that. Uh, and this is the other thing. They feed themselves. Once they're maybe six inches tall, they're going to be stuck full of bugs, uh, provided there are bugs around. I have found though that the seedlings will benefit from a spray of Max C, and I, I use that as a, I mix a quarter teaspoon in a gallon of water for that, which I think is pretty standard for people. Uh, if I could go back to the water thing one more time, when there's seeds, I water two or three times a day. So I go out in the morning, I use a can of, you know, like a pump sprayer. I go out in the morning, spray them down so that they're good and wet. And I check them if I can throughout the day. Obviously working from home now, it's quite easy to check them in a regular uh, work pre-pandemic or work life. I was only able to check the morning and evening. And they seem to do okay with the water in the morning and the water in the evening. Again, it's not a, a big pour of water. It's using a, either a spray bottle or a can of, or a pump sprayer to, to water them so that the peat is really good and soaked. And that helps your seeds grow and that helps your seedlings grow. Did this, I guess this talk didn't take the hour that I thought it would. Um, and here's my last slide. I've also borrowed from the internet of them in Habitat. This is a multi-branched um, plant. It looks really cool. Lots of flowers. They're going to be probably 200 seeds on that plant, I would think. Um, I would love to hear from other people with differing experiences or answer any questions you have. Um, Again, this is a fascinating plant. It's easy to grow. Once you pot it, it's once and done. It's not like your Saracenias that you're hauling out in January, repotting 40 of them with two bales of peat and starting fresh every year. This, this, the, the easy part of these is that it, if you do it this way with the clay pots and the, and the slack potting, it's called, it's one and done. So 
um, so there I am. I, I, I hope um, I've shared some info from you guys with you guys and please let me know if you have any questions. I think that they do have some questions, oh, but good. before we get into the questions, I'm gonna give everybody a chance to keep putting into the chat box any questions that you uh, that is occurring to you. Some of you might be shy and don't wanna uh, talk out loud. Feel free to tap in your question to the uh, chat box and we'll give you a few them, moments yeah. to think of those questions. Go oh, ahead. I see here from Bill's iPad a question about RO water or tap. Yeah, they want pure water. Um, I, I'm sorry I didn't mention that. That seems very, fair, fairly obvious with all of us and carnivores that they need pure water. Um, the clay pot serves a couple of functions. First of all, it serves to pull moisture out of the soil mix, which you know in many ways simulates how soil is. I, I like to plant succulents and cacti in clay whenever I can so that if it gets rained on or anything, it helps to, de to pull water out of the pot. Um, so this, it seems to simulate what, what, we're, what you see in, in nature. But yeah, pure water, please. Um, unless your tap water is like what they say, under, under 50 parts per million. And then how much and how often do you water adult plants? I water them every two to three days. And I would say each time in a 12 inch pot, I probably give them about half a gallon of water. Um, and I just pour it around the outside of the pot as opposed to, and sometimes it gets in the middle. But again, I'm, I'm a little paranoid about them and about keeping them uh, from rotting or anything. So I try to pour it around the outside of the pot or just closer to the middle. Okay, so going back to the question, Dean, about RO water, I just wanted to clarify. You, you said under 50 ppm, um, was that right? Is that what you said? Just I think that's sure. something that's standard. What people, um, what people uh, say in you know the, in our carnivorous plant circles that you want your water under fifty parts per million. I have always either used distilled or a um, reverse osmosis water. So, do you, do you find that they are um, in comparison to other carnivorous plants? Do you find them to be more sensitive of the carnivorous plants or less sensitive as far as the PPM is concerned? I don't know. I've never watered them with anything else. So okay. I, if other people online may have experience with that. Yeah, maybe we'll have a discussion. In I would love that, about. yeah. Yeah, okay, let's see. And then you answer the second question about how often you water. Now let's take that third question. How big do you let seedlings get before you start backing off on water? I don't ever back off on water. So. I may back off on um, on the daily spraying of that little peat pot in the middle, but you still have to keep the whole, you know, the pot watered. Uh, they they need water constantly. So, like I said, in in the adults, I'll water them with a half a gallon of water probably two, every two or three days. If it's really hot, they'll get watered every day. So, and that's something that uh, people who grow them farther inland. I'm about a mile and a half from the beach, so. It's a very cool, um, moderate climate here. I don't know what would happen if you go into, say, um, Pasadena or Riverside. Uh, I know um, Adam has, has taken one of my plants, and so he might have some information on how it has done for him out there in San Bernardino, where it gets really hot in the summer. And um, I'm, more, I'm definitely more of a coastal climate right here. All right, let's see. Maggie, have you ever grown them? I have, I have actually grown one. <laughs> and um, I neglected it to, like it was given to me and I, uh, I'm, because I was sort of focusing on other genuses, I really neglected the heck out of it. And it just exploded big, bigger, 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 bigger. And I have disturbed the roots and nothing happened to it. Oh my God. And, and when it drops seed into the same pot, it grew more from the same pot. And then you know how it died? <laughs> Some neighborhood kid came by with a bike and kicked the pot over. Oh. That's how it died. <laughs> but it was- He, it was, it he was disturbed here. the seed, but he disturbed the roots, see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we still have time, so don't be shy. Go ahead and look yeah, at Yeah, I had a question for you, Dean. Yes. Um, up here, uh, it's a little 
cooler and wetter during the spring uh, into early summer. I actually have a seedling that I'm looking to acclimate uh, to the outside. Should I wait until it stops raining so much? Would that be detrimental Where are you? to let it get rained on? Oregon. Uh, you know, that's a good question. I leave mine out all winter in the rain. Uh -huh. I mean, obviously, we don't get as much rain as, as uh, you would do up in Oregon, but uh, they seem to like it, you know? Everything. Every, I, I, I've yet to find a plant that doesn't like to be rained on. That's a good <laughs> Maybe point. Maybe some of those weird <laughs> succulents, uh, some of the ones that I'm used to killing. But um, most, most of everything we have likes a good rain shower. Um, That's a good point. Um, and then would you have any special uh, tips on acclimating it outside, or should I just put it out when it's consistently sunny? Yeah, I would do that. I would. Yeah. Uh, what? How? What's the temperature up there now? Right now, it's 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 pretty cool as far as compared to where you guys are. It's sixty. Well, they can handle it. I mean, we get here at my house. I get temperatures down in the high thirties for a couple nights in the winter, uh, and nights in the forties are quite regular from December to uh, to February. Really, even into March they were. So um, it's never an issue. It hasn't been yet, and I know in Europe it gets this cold. So. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, it just depends on what it, what kind of mix you have it in. Um, but it, I think it's pretty similar to what you have. It's it's fairly loose. So yeah, I would I, you know just out of caution, I think I would wait a few more weeks for it to warm up a little more. Yeah, yeah, I think I might wait till seventies. But uh, thank you, I appreciate that. You're welcome. All right. Fantastic. There is a, a question from Paul. Um, it says, I have a limited area on my patio for CP. It sounds like a recommended 12 inch pot would produce a large plant. Would the plant thrive in a smaller pot? Well, that's a good question. Like I said, I've grown them in 10 inch pots and they, uh, they still make a big plant, but it is noticeably smaller than the ones that grew in the 12 inch pots. So, um, so yeah, you know, I mean, I would try try dropping as you know do the same peat pot in a maybe a an eight inch pot or something like I guess maybe an eight inch pot you could just water the whole thing, but um, you might get a, a bit of a stunted pot plant then and that way you wouldn't need as much space for it. It is a problem with these big clay pots you know they do they do take up space and um, with everything else I grow and we all grow it, space sometimes is at a premium so something to think about. And it's interesting, a lot, you know, Drosophilum and Biblis and um, the Droseras, I mean, there's a lot of them that kind of have a very similar look as plants, you know, they've evolved together or convergently to, to look like this and to, to perform the way they do. So, you know, if you don't want to grow a Drosophilum, maybe you grow a, a Dreamsicle uh, Sundew or something like that which gives you the same look to it, certainly. It will certainly produce just as many seeds, but they won't, of course, be Drosophilum seeds, but, uh, so, but there are ways to get that look in a, in a smaller plant. Although if you look at Sandy Casey's dream cycle, you know, the thing's taken over the world, and the one I got from her is starting to take over the world too. It's the best plant ever, so. All right. Uh, let's see, maybe we can move on towards some group discussion. Let's see if, if we want to do that. Uh, let's unmute everybody and we De see if... Dean, uh, yes. I'm really curious what pollinates the Drosophyllums because whatever it is, it's got to be very brave because those flowers look like really low on the plant, right? Yeah, that's a very good point, Braulio. I mean, they, they're <laughs> going to eat the pollinator if they, if they get a chance to. So I don't know. I've never sat out there and watched for very long um, to see. It's kind of counterproductive when you think about it. I'm right, going right, to ice right. you in, but, but uh, I'm going to kill you as well. So, so. <laughs> okay, Paul, you asked another question. Two to three hours of sun a day. Do you think that's enough? 
you can only try, you know, um, I tend to go with what people write about or I find in books or online and what I feel are reputable sources. But I think a lot of new um, tips about growing plants really comes from, from everybody trying different things. And until we all get to that point where we've tried these things a million different ways, we're not gonna really know. Um, I'm a chicken when it comes to them. You know, if you put a month into waiting for a seed to grow and four or five months for it to get more adult size, I, I don't wanna mess around with it because I don't wanna be set back in time that much, but, but it's worth a try. All right, let's see. Shall we have a discussion now? Maybe, maybe it's to hear from other people who have grown it. I'd love and to. Would you guys like to do that? Uh, give, give people a chance to, I'm gonna ask everybody to unmute if you'd like to participate in the uh, discussion. Or, let's see, just go ahead and unmute. I think you should be able to unmute yourself now, guys. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, I have grown Drosophyllum. Um, I'm at work watering plants at a nursery right now. So I'm talking while I'm working. But um, a couple of tips from what I've seen. I've read different reports, you know, where uh, they say Drosophyllum has uh, natural fire occurrences in its natural habitat. Um, and I read reports where some growers had gone through to burn the uh, old leaves. Um, so I had a really nice drosophyllum a few years back, mature, bloomed, uh, got seeds off of it, everything was great. Uh, um, I did try the fire and I'll just recommend don't do that. It killed my, <laughs> it killed my plants. <laughs> Uh, maybe some of them, maybe they do fine with it in the wild in certain circumstances, um, but I imagine there would be losses even in the wild. And uh, if you have a prized plant, don't, don't mess with that. <laughs> oh, no. So uh, we're about to try some more seeds this, uh, this year. So we're looking, thanks uh, for the information and looking forward to trying them again. Fantastic. Right. If you have anything you'd like to say about your experience around growing, uh, I'm, I'm going to try saying it the way Dean said it. Dean, tell me how you say it. Again. I just say Drosophyllum. Drosophyllum. And then but, there's. Yeah, I looked online before this to see what the pronunciation, and there are several <laughs> pronunciations, and Drosophyllum is one too. It just doesn't work so well in my mouth for some reason. <laughs> okay. So if you'd like to. Uh, participate and, and uh, give us some feedback on how you've been grow growing your Drosophyllum. <laughs> Please un unmute yourself, and then when you're talking, when you finish talking, mute yourself again. Uh, Adam, is you're still growing? Are you are you still on? I think I think Adam's microphone um, had a problem. He, he oh. messaged me that his his had a problem. Okay. But I mean, I myself have grown them in smaller pots. Going back to the one, the the issue about pot sizes, the pot that I had it growing in was a it was a five by five first, and then it, I moved it up to a seven by seven, and they were all plastic pots because I didn't know how to grow them. It still did fantastic, and uh, I and I didn't water it every two or three days. I watered it like once every ten days, and it just kept flourishing. Um, I was, I was, I was admittedly, I, I didn't like the plant that much because <laughs> I was focusing on everything else. And so I was just keeping it alive because, you know, it's a plant, it's a living thing. And I was just watering it when I remembered to, which is like every 10 days. And I had it in a, a nearly all perlite. It was terrible the way I treated it. I feel so bad now. I have like guilt, guilt complex about it now, <laughs> but, um, but it, it's, it's much hardier than people think. Yeah, that's what I wanted to hear because, you know, I've only done it this one way and you, you hear so many horror stories. Um, but so we know that it can grow in plastic pots. I think Jin, I don't know if he's on the call, but one of the meetings, last meetings we had in Alhambra, he had, he had a nice one in a plastic, like a one gallon plastic pot. And it had flower, flower or uh, seed capsules all over it. So um, obviously plastic does work. 
So, and maybe that's what kept it, um, kept it going between waterings because it didn't wick off the moisture so quickly. All right. Yeah, you know, I uh, I did want to chime in also on the question with the you know if you could grow them in two to three hours of sunlight. Um, I've seen several other growers having them in what I would call uh, sub subpar conditions, which uh, would be less light. Like uh, um, I've seen that they they will grow in less light. Uh, they'll just be the stem elongates. They'll be really leggy. The uh, you know they're soft and um, they look really brittle brittle actually like they, they do not look like a hardy plant um, so when they recommend full sun uh, I think that's the best if you can do that um, but they can grow in less light but they, as for as far as their longevity and their health uh, does from what I've seen other growers it's not not going to work that well well, I wonder what would happen if we fed it more. Well, uh, I mean, there's the feeding. Uh, they get the nutrients from the feeding, of course, but the energy, as you know, comes from the sun. Uh, and the ability to photosynthesize is what makes the ability to create your cellular, structure, cellular structures and gives the rigidity and um, health to the the leaves and stems so without that sunlight you're not going to be able to build those strong cellular structures and feeding it would not sort of mitigate the problem of having not enough light for photosynthesis i don't think so mm. i thought i would just jump in because uh can you hear me out there yes yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm in Colorado and uh, my limited experience, I had a couple plants, uh, grew them for about two years. They, they flowered after about a year and a half and uh, I got seed off of them. And, uh, but they did die suddenly shortly Order after model. that. Select two lanes to turn left onto Warner Avenue. Oh, wow. <laughs> hmm. I don't think that was me. Um, <laughs> Anyway, they died shortly after after uh, producing seed. I was kind of wondering if that might have been what pushed them over the edge. Uh, I grow in a greenhouse, um, and uh, but yeah, they they did well. I think this year in Colorado, I'm going to try growing some outdoors at least during the summer. I have to bring them in the winter and see how they do. I think they actually might. Sound, seems like they might like it, but I didn't. I didn't want to risk it. Kind of like you, I don't want to kill the plants, <laughs> so I kept them in the greenhouse. Uh, you know before but i've got about 50 little seedlings um yeah oh. I, I i assume that like i wouldn't have much luck germinating them but uh but they just kept germ they just kept growing so now i've got about 50 little ones that i'm not quite sure what to do with um <laughs> and, you can always uh, donate so, them you yeah donate so them to us. I'll, ex I'll experiment a whole lot more um you know since i i'll, I'll have some to spare hopefully they're my, my biggest one's only about an inch and a half. So, uh, you know, there's still a chance that uh, I can kill them at the fragile stage. But um, but anyway, that's my experience with them. So um, I've grown them uh, to, to adulthood on, I guess, two separate occasions, maybe three, if I recall. But um, in Utah, as well as uh, in Virginia, um, both cases, the, the time they did the best was uh, definitely when they put them outside and full sun and um, it's a different beast maybe sometimes in the east with uh, different rain patterns and humidity um, but that's always been my experience that they did much better outside all right I'd like to ask um, for those of us not local to uh, the LA area what are good sources of seed The question was, if, if you're not local to LA area, what, what are the sources of seed for the, for the Drosophyllum plant? Or Dean. For... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you could win the raffle. Um, I think I got a several sets of, I, I offered several sets of five seeds. Um, I got my original seeds from Cascade Carnivores. And you know, uh, they don't offer them regularly. And I think some of the Carnivorous plant places, you know, the stores online will offer them from time to time if they have them. 
so I, I got my first two plants from California carnivores, but those were seedlings that I bought from them. I think I had to be like on a wait list and they eventually told me when they had some available. California think, carnivores is out really, of them right now. I don't think they offer seed anymore, but that's where I got my seed several years back, several years back. Yeah. Huh. Seems like there's more people that want them than there are available. Yeah, they're kind of rare. Uh, and I think some of it's because they don't, you know, the whole don't transplant them idea. And if it's in that loose mix, you know, I think if I, the reason I, I said we can't ship those 12-inch uh, pots is because, first of all, they weigh 20 pounds. And second of all, I just think you would end up with a box full of loose medium running around the box mm -hmm. and a dried up seedling of some sort. So, Maggie, this is Bryce. I've got a quick question. Oh, Bryce. Uh, for the group, you know, we often grow with all these carnivorous plants as specimens, like in a vacuum in its own pot and everything. I'm just curious for uh, Drosoph Drosophilum, Drosophilum, um, if anybody's grown them with com native companion plants like Erica's and Heath's and like the, the native Western Mediterranean chaparral plants and kind of like an ecosystem scenario. Hmm. That's a good question. Anyone? I was wondering the same, actually. That would be awesome. I'm sorry? Say that one more time? I'm sorry. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. Uh, that would be part two of uh, Dean's presentation yeah. for next year. <laughs> I have no nature in my neighborhood. I mean, it's, it's block walls and lawns. So. Hey, Bryce. <laughs> Right, that's, that's your project. That's and then we're going to ask you to talk next. <laughs> I'm going to need a bigger pot then. <laughs> well, if, if somebody has a nice natural hillside behind their house, that would be kind of cool to scatter some seeds and mark it and see if you could, you know, in the spring if they actually came up after the rains. It's probably not good form right. for, for gardeners to be naturalizing things. But nevertheless, I don't think, I don't think this that we run the risk of them taking over the world. I can give it a shot. Yeah, especially but, if they get run over by kids on bikes. <laughs> Let me know if you need some seeds, Dave. Um, I'm gonna ask you guys to t take a look at the chat box because suddenly my iPad froze and doesn't work. So I can't open up the chat box to see if there's any more questions, but I see two comments there. Are there two questions there? Uh, no questions. One of those is a comment. Uh, it says, uh, I got from Dan Luke, Daniel Lucas. I got my seeds on the CP groups on, the, on Facebook on several occasions. And then the other one's just Paul Falk saying he had to go. So. All right. Um, I did have a question. Um, was it Dean? Uh, you're, uh, you had uh, shown that when you start the seed, you start them in a larger pot, but with the uh, heat pots uh, indented into the larger pot. Yes. Um, I have started seed in peat, in peat pots, what I've normally done, uh, and then if they germinate and start to grow, then I transfer them to the larger pot. But what's the benefit of, um, I guess, having the smaller pot if you go ahead and sow them in the larger pot? To begin with like what does that do for you what it does for me is it means i only have to water the center of the pot you know that little i only water the peat pot to get the seeds started so i'm not you know okay mucking up all the soil and the rest of the pot right away uh you know gotcha. there you know when you over pot something uh a lot of times the soil can if, if, if there are no roots pulling out of it the soil can get uh i don't know what you call it, fouled or something um, now, you know, with this kind of loose, dry medium, it may not be the case, but um, it, it just deals with my paranoia about growing things that, you know, you do it the right way so you don't have to do it again and, right. uh, and wait. Because uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I am kind of instant gratification with my plants. And if I can get them to grow fast and well, I'm happy. So... I think that's a good answer. Um, yeah, I'll, I will say it's it's easy in a small pot, of course, to you're not trying to keep it too wet, and then you end up forgetting a day, and you end up letting it dry out too much. So I 
I can see benefit there. Okay. Mm -hmm. One thing I've noticed about well, like from the dead ones when I've dumped the, the, the old medium out, the, the whole pot inside is coated with uh, the remains of roots. So it, mm. it's like they send out a really fine network of roots everywhere in the pot. And if I had more of them, I probably would unpot a lot, you know, a living one just to see what those roots look like. But again, I'm chicken. So, um, so I think they probably, and maybe you know Richard from repotting them or moving them out of small pots. Do they fill the pot with roots, the little guys? Um, you know, uh, while I'm using the peat pots, I uh, I don't remove them from the pot. I just go ahead and pop. You just the drop them in into then. the larger pot, right? Um, I do make sure there's some kind of hole in the bottom, like you mentioned. Um, but yeah, uh, the one time I did uh, repot a drossip island for a friend uh, who sort of had it in the shadier conditions I was mentioning, um, it survived. Uh, so they can do transplanting uh, if you are very, at least from my experience, if you're very careful with the roots. but. I wouldn't bet on it, I guess. Yeah. You know how a tomato seedling, when you get them out of those six packs, it's just jammed with roots. Right. And nothing falls out when you pull it out. I just worried that when, but this guy, when, first of all, there's very little to hold on to. And second of all, um, I just see all that. In my head, I see that medium just go whoop and, and fall apart. So I, maybe, I'll, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll start one in a, in a two and a half inch pot or a three inch pot and see what happens. A plastic pot. And, and see if I can transplant it. Uh, I'll report back if I do. I would just comment, um, and I've seen this with a lot of other plants, there's sometimes there's a fascination on, you know, a particular soil mix that works uh, well or anything. So um, I find with Drosophyllum and many other plants, of course, that, uh, you know, they're really adaptable. For example, if you don't have pumice, I've never used pumice. Uh, um, my three successful times growing dust file on the maturity uh, is, you know, perlite, sand, uh, peat, and vermiculite in a couple cases uh, with great results. So if you can't find one particular soil ingredient, um, you know, make do with what you have. And uh, as long as for dust file, I think if it's uh, airy, uh, can drain well, um, it can do well. Richard, where are you located? Right now I'm in Tennessee, um, but like I said, I've grown dross phylum in Utah and Virginia. I just think that if you live in SoCal and you don't have a drosophyllum, I don't know what you're growing, man. You gotta have one. <laughs> it's so easy to grow here. Effortless. They are super easy. <laughs> Even if you don't like them very much, as long as nobody kicks one over. You exactly, no kids riding bikes. No kids riding bikes <laughs> kicking plants over, then you got it made. I forget about mine from time to time. And I'm like, oh, shit, I should probably water this thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll let you know. That's what's beautiful about this plant. It'll let you know because it starts looking a little droopy. And you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot to water it. You water it. And within minutes, I want to say maybe less than an hour, it's perked up already, back up and in business. Wow. I'm excited to try them. I haven't tried one yet. Yeah, I, for me, it was just... I'm always like super excited when a plant seed grows. Because, uh, you know, sometimes you'll try growing things like tomatoes or eggplants or something from seed. And for me, for me it's usually a lame excuse to throw things away. But um, these guys, I, I was just so delighted when they took off and grew so easily.